Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for allowing for us to um, talk to you today. Our aim today is really quite simple. We, what we wanted to do is to offer you something different. Um, we're actually here to say that there's a little bit more to the cyber domain than just cyber and technical stuff. So the screen that you can see in front of you today is um, our sort of outline of what we wish to do. And we're going to offer you an opening premise. We're going to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. We're going to explain to you why maritime cyber is such a challenge to decision makers. And then we're going to have a look at this thing called cyber decision resilience, uh, which we think is, is really in two parts. It's about achieving cognitive readiness and it's about achieving decision readiness. Uh, um, and if you do both of those, you will have achieved cyber decision readiness. We aim to talk to you today for about 20 minutes and then we can take some uh, um, questions after that. So no further ado, on to the next slide. Have you try using your keyboard, David? I, I, I am, it's not working, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I mentioned we were going to start with an opening premise, and this is it. And it's again, it's in it's in three parts. And the first one is that um, the, the maritime nature, the, mar the the maritime environment is is of a completely unique na nature to any other environment. And we think because of it, cyber threats are far more challenging, and they may well require an enhanced or a non-conventional approach to decision making. We also believe that this is under-recognized or unrecognized and that either of those will have significant negative consequences on that decision-making process. And therefore, we suggest to you that being decision resilient can help avoid these consequences before they occur or mitigate them once they have. So who are we and what do we do? Well, we're, we're actually two separate organizations, Mind Science Limited and Decision Praxis Limited. And what we seek to do is to um, come together and help people make optimal decisions. And by optimal decisions, we simply mean decisions made at the appropriate time, noting there is a very right and there's a very wrong time to make a decision and many variations in between, using the appropriate techniques. And again, there are very right and very wrong techniques for making decisions and using the, the appropriate psychology and process. So as you can see from this diagram, we believe that the human part represented by mind science and decision praxis, um, cognitive readiness and decision readiness sort of complements the technical stuff that the, the, the engineers and the, and the process experts and the, and the cyber experts will bring to maritime decision resilience. So moving on, why, is, um, why do we think that maritime cyber is such a challenge to decision makers? Um, and this is really a combination of, of many, many factors, um, but I'm just going to pick up and talk about three as we go through here. Um, the first one is, is simple, and anybody who has had anything to do with the maritime world will, will know this, and it's, it's, it's down to the factor of geography. You know, 95% of world trade moves by sea, and roughly 75% of the Earth's surface is covered by sea. There is therefore very little that is done by or consumed by or used by or needed by human beings that is not in some way associated with either moving by the sea or on the sea. Um, the second part of this relates to the technical stuff that I sort of uh, referred to in a previous uh, uh, diagram. And it's really to do with the ease and accuracy that cyber has brought to the maritime world. For those of us old enough to remember uh, how you sailed ships and cargoes around the oceans before computers and cyber came along. A simple comparison of how it's done now will, let, will, will, will make you aware that it's, it is much, much easier, owing to things like GPS, AIS, you know, vessel traffic systems, et cetera, to, to help you move stuff around. And then on board ships or, on, or in harbors or ports, you have cargo management systems, route planning, custom systems, you know, everything effectively now has been made an awful lot easier and an awful lot quicker by uh, um, the use of cyber in its various shapes or form. Indeed, I think it's probably accurate to say that, uh, you know, the accuracy and ease with which stuff is moved around the maritime system at the moment can be completely, completely controlled by the, the cyber world. And that leads to the third factor, 
Um, and that's what I call the sort of vulnerability versus a value. And what do I mean by that? Well, every cargo moved at sea can be strategic. It can have significant national consequences. Um, you only need to look at the, uh, the recent events of the, of the ship stranded in the Suez Canal to realize how very quickly, you know, a 24-hour delay of one ship in the Suez Canal can add four or five or possibly even six weeks worth of um, supply chain risk and damage. And talking about the Suez leads me to my next point. Of course, while 75% of the Earth's surface is covered by sea, there are a significant number of what are known as choke points, very narrow points where all shipping has to go. Suez, Babel Mandab, Straits of Hormuz, English Channel, to name just a few. Um, sort of third point in this section is the complex and absent governance uh, um, at sea, whilst ships inside the 12 mile limit, or indeed in ports and harbours, are subject to reasonable governance. On the high seas, it is very easy to argue that they're not. In fact, the high seas have been uh, um, noted as probably the last ungoverned space on, um, on earth, uh, which, which gives rise to my fourth bullet there. There is a rising innocence and therefore a rising potential for maritime crime, much of it cyber related, some of it related to terrorism, some of it related to great power and non-state competition and conflict. In my other life, uh, I, I spend a bit of time as an academic looking at great power and non-state competition and conflict at sea. And the maritime space is becoming the new grey space, the grey space being the area where proxy conflicts between a, all organisations will be fought because of this idea that there is complex and or absent governance at sea. So that's why we think that decision making, uh, and particularly maritime cyber decisions, decision making is very, very challenging. And the diagram at the right simply uh, seeks to, to illustrate that and offers some of the some of the choices, some of the you know known knowns or unknown unknowns, to to use the Rumsfeld typology there, you know various different decision types, various different decision um, types and outcomes, you know identifying whether what you're looking at is a choice, whether it's an option, a risk, or a dilemma. Uh, um, you know there is a difference between a choice and a dilemma. There is a difference between an option and a risk, um, and the way that you approach those uh, will, will affect the um, the optimal nature of the decision that you make. You know, you can have situations where there are, you know, where, the, where things that you know, things that are uncertain, things that are ambiguous and things that are volatile, they all challenge both the, uh, the human psychology and the human process of decision making. So, um, cyber decision re resilience, what we're here to talk to you about today. As I said before, it's a combination of three things. Cognitive readiness, which we believe is maximizing the human input to the decision process. Decision readiness, uh, which is making sure the decision process is optimally designed and executed. And all of that needs to be situated within a thorough understanding of the context specific decision space, which in this case, of course, is the maritime space. So Bex, over to you. Okay, thank you, David. Um, David was talking there about why maritime cyber is such a challenge to decision makers. He talked about the geography, accuracy, the ease of systems management, and then also, most importantly, I think, issues around vulnerability versus value. Now, these types of issues combine to make an incredibly context, um, complex environment. There is no simple solutions based on logical reasons. Any decisions have negative impacts in other areas. And these are known as wicked problems. I've put a reference on here if you're interested in reading more about that. Um, Keith Grint, who's an ex-colleague of mine, has done some really incredible research in this area. What this chart demonstrates is that when situations are complex, a different type of thinking is needed. Um, he describes it as normative stroke emotional, so soft power. With that, we need to de develop advanced level soft skills, and that's what we call cognitive readiness. Next slide, please, David. No, other way, that's it, thank you. <laughs> so cognitive readiness, what actually is that? It's a combination of different types of skills. So first of all, we have advanced thinking skills. 
And what I mean by that is the ability to challenge what we think is a given, what we already know, how to be creative in our thinking and how to think from a problem solving perspective. We need advanced people skills. And the reason that that's so important is because when you are working in a very complex environment, there are a lot of different actors, state and non-state, and you need to be able to understand how to build relationships with a wide range of people in order to be able to work with them to solve these problems. And thirdly, adaptive expertise. This is about the skill to not look at the situation for what it appears to be, but to learn to spot underlying patterns and themes and trends um, in the way that situations unfold. However, it isn't just about learning these skills, it's also about the way that we learn them. Traditional classroom methods actually inhibit you learning these skills. We tend to learn if this, then that. So in certain circumstances, you apply a framework and you get the answer to the problem. That in itself does not allow for the creativity and innovation in thinking that you need to do to tackle wicked problems. So it's time for something different. Next slide, please. And that something different is cognitive readiness. It's not just about what you learn, it's about how you learn. So as I said, traditional training courses inhibit this. They're great for passing on information. They're not so great when it comes from developing soft skills from novice level right through to expert. To do this, you need to use a range of constructive learning techniques. You need to embed this learning into your practice and continually review progress. Know what you can do well, but also to know what your development needs are. So we don't teach you what to think, we teach you how to think, so you can better understand the complexity of the situations you find yourselves in. And it's using these psychological principles that helps you build a resilient team of people. The more expertise you develop, the more confident you become in both your learning and your practice. If you're more confident, then you know that you have the ability to deal with the complexity and the, the new situations that you find yourself in. You become resilient enough to face a range of wicked problems. Learning really is a lifelong process. And if you understand these points and you can develop advanced skills, you have resilient people who are confident in their abilities and you ensure that you get transfer of training to the workplace. So now I've explained a bit more about the skills you need, I'm going to hand back to David, who will explain how you can put these skills to use in decision readiness. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so the next part of the presentation is, 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 is building on Rebecca's points about cognitive readiness and moving on to what we call decision readiness. Um, and there are effectively three parts to decision readiness. And the first part is, is what this slide is all about. It's about identifying problem types and determining the most appropriate decision-making techniques. Now, as an aside, um, in sort of 30 years of doing this sort of work, I've come across many, many, many people who would describe themselves as excellent problem solvers and excellent decision takers and excellent decision makers. Very few of them on probing have actually been able to tell me what sort of decision they're um, addressing or what sort of problem that they have in front of them. They seem to do it intuitively. Um, and there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Some people are excellent intuitive decision makers, but some people are not. And I've noticed that actually the, the you know, the, 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 the efficacy of an intuitive approach to decision making is uh, uh, directly um, linked to the complexity or the nature of the problem. And I suppose my, my simple point here is that the more complex and the more uh, uh, chaotic the problem type that you have, the, the less you can rely on an intuitive sort of decision-making process to get you to the right decision. So the first part of decision readiness is all about identifying different problem types and, and having done that, and from that, determining the most appropriate decision-making techniques, because there are many different problem types and there are many different techniques for addressing them. Some of them are mainly right, some of them are mainly wrong, very few of them are perfectly right, very few of them are perfectly wrong. 
and therefore needed to understand this, this sort of typology that's shown on this slide and others like it, because this is just one of many, um, in order to make sure that you get to that optimal decision making um, process and technique. So my understanding um, from sort of 20 years of, of liking to think of myself as a maritime problem solver is that most maritime problem types begin to start in the top right hand corner. Uh, there's no such thing as a simple maritime problem. Um, many of them are complicated. They're becoming more and more complex. And from there, they stray into the chaotic and the disorder space, particularly when you introduce things like cyber. And back to this, the slide talking about the vulnerability versus value here. Uh, um, and it's quite interesting to note that if you have, you know, you have a, a, a large maritime problem with a sort of geostrategic geosocial issues associated with it if your problem is in the chaotic or the disorder space you can begin to see now the danger of, of of it being so and i would simply suggest that because of the ubiquity of cyber in the maritime world um, that is going to become more of a problem so the first part of decision readiness is about identifying problem types and from that determining the most appropriate decision making techniques to use the second part, and it follows on from the first, is what's shown on this little diagram here. Um, and th this, is, th this, is, this is purely my thinking, but it's backed up by lots of uh, academic referencing and, and, and practical experience. So the second part of decision readiness is about identifying the right techniques to conduct decision testing and the right time within the decision making process to conduct them. And if you think this all sounds a little bit processy and procedural, then Perhaps it is, but I go back to the point I made earlier. Many decision makers are actually intuitive decision makers, and they do a really good job right up to the point until they find something that they have not come across before. Um, you will remember in a previous slide that I had uh, the differences between choice options, risks, and dilemmas, um, and that's where I will start with this diagram here. There are they all are different, all require different techniques, all have different issues associated with them and the trouble is you will find that many many intuitive experienced successful decision making makers will simply misidentify a choice as a risk or a dilemma as an option um, and i would suggest to you bex and i would suggest to you that that's probably not the best place to, uh, to to be in the cyber decision readiness space so the second part of decision readiness as i say it's, it's about identifying the right techniques to conduct decision testing and the right time within the decision making process to conduct them and this can be a variety of things this can be red teaming um, and i won't explain what that is but very simply it, it, it is using experts to take apart the decision that you have made to make sure that it is absolutely correct it doesn't have to take a long time it can be done very quickly but it is absolutely important um, you can have action and consequence analysis if you have a, a you know a cyber problem in the maritime space and you decide to do let's call it x you need to understand what the consequences are of doing X or indeed of not doing X. And there are techniques and tools and processes that can help you understand the actions of, and any of the consequences of, of your decision. You can do decision gaming, uh, also called war gaming. Um, war gaming, particularly in the UK during the pandemic, has become very, very uh, um, it's sort of to the fore in the media. The government is always war gaming something or something else doesn't mean it's anything to do with war. It just means that it's, it is using experts in the decision making process in decision readiness and cognitive readiness to game their decisions as they do. And finally, on the right hand side of this diagram, we can talk a little bit about behavior and image analysis because um, that is becoming more and more important. And it's it, it, it plays into the idea that you can be posed with dilemmas, i.e. a decision or a choice where you have the you have to choose between two quite um, poor options, both of which are going to hurt you. And it simply offers a, uh, another way other than actions to, to suggest how you might narrate and take those decisions and judge them. So that's the second part of decision readiness. It's, a, it's as I said, it's about identifying the right techniques to conduct decision testing and the right time within the decision making process to conduct them. And the final part, um, is, is, is about locating all of this, the cognitive readiness, the previous two parts of decision readiness, um, within 
what we call the decision space. And here we're going to um, just take you back to a little fairy tale um, written by a Victorian gentleman some, some while ago. Uh, uh, Alice in Wonderland, I'm sure you've all heard it, um, and I'm sure most of you will probably remember the quote from the White Queen to Alice, who, who um, told Alice that she had learned to believe six impossible things before breakfast. And I, I would put it to the audience that actually thinking impossible things is becoming uh, even more possible these days for a variety of reasons. Not least, I would say, because the, 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 the access that cyber as a whole gives people to information tends to make them want to believe impossible things before breakfast, because there is a distinct difference between what you think the facts say, and there's a distinct difference between what, what of those facts confirm your own beliefs, and put the two together, and you quite often get very experienced decision makers making decisions that are clearly impossible, or clearly relate to impossible things, i.e. the wonderland, um, as we call it here, or the decision space. So our final sort of uh, um, point um, is that within all the technology that is within cyber, um, and particularly maritime cyber, please don't forget the human being in here, and please don't forget the human being's potential, given all the data that um, IT and computers now give them, to actually use that data and their own human inbuilt human biases to begin to believe impossible things before breakfast. Um, most of us, and I include myself in here, are much happier with decisions that are made that support our own inbuilt beliefs. They are recognized and comfortable and therefore we persuade ourselves that it is the right thing to do. So the third part of this decision readiness idea is that uh, we, all, these, all the things that Rebecca and I have spoken about before all have to sit within a context, contextual decision space in order to avoid impossible decisions before breakfast or pretending that you're in Wonderland. So ladies and gentlemen, um, in, in summary, uh, Rebecca and I are very, very clear about this. We actually know very little about the technical issues of maritime cyber resilience. We understand that it is a huge problem and we believe that there is a little bit more to it than just you know, com computers, networks, processors, clouds, fallback systems, redundancy, the internet and data, as I said, all of which is very important, but it is not perhaps uh, um, important without the input of a human being. And we suggest that, that you know, human cyber resilience is a factor of cognitive readiness and decision readiness. And it's all situated within this thorough understanding of the, of the context specific, in this case, maritime decision space. Um, we'll be very happy to chat to anyone who wishes to take this further and perhaps even help them to avoid the maritime cyber Alice paradox, i.e. being able to believe or persuade yourself to believe impossible things before breakfast. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. The world we live in is complex and uncertain. We need advanced decision making. However, do you address the limitations of the current culture of simple minded management with sound bites, dollar value and elevator presentation? Um, David, I don't know if you have a comment on that. Um, I, I, I do have a comment on it, and I think it's, it in, entirely encapsulates what our sort of presentation is about. I fully recognize the simple minded management, sound bites, dollar values, elevator presentation. Um, in, in my own past world, the, 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 the military, nothing, uh, no decision was made that could not be summarized in three bullet points on a PowerPoint slide. Um, and I refuse to buy into that. The world is a complex space and therefore reductionism is absolutely the wrong approach to take to it. Mm. And I'd just like to add to that. Um, it's very, our, our mind is a limited capacity information processor and that's where the comfort comes from. We like things to be in boxes and our brain organizes things that way. And that's why we struggle so much with the complexity of the environments that we're facing. Um, I've had lots of challenges over the last sort of 15, 20 years of my career trying to get people to understand that it isn't just a management technique. Um, that we need to learn. My hope now is that given the pandemic that we've all been living through, 
I am feeling that there is very much a sea change in, in terms of um, attitude towards things. The pandemic has made us realise that we have to do things differently. We have to be more agile. We have to be able to react and come up with innovative solutions with no notice whatsoever. We've now we've lived through it, I think and hope that there is going to be some sort of changes into the way that organisations are structured and work because the pandemic has disrupted our way of thinking. And as we build forward into a new way forward, I think that hopefully this sort of thinking is going to become more accepted in the management space. Do we have any other questions? Um, uh, Joseph mentions that uh, we have to realise the features of the strategic environment in cyberspace. And I think that's something else that's also important. Um, cybersecurity sometimes is seen as a, a department when actually what it is, it, it is, it doesn't just sit in itself. It permeates every single sort of area within an organisation from strategy right down to the people who are doing threat hunting and protecting against um, cyber attacks. And I think there is also some sort of realisation, as Joseph says, needed that it is not just a technology problem. It's an issue that, that permeates through the entire organisational structure. Rex, if I could just come in on that as well, I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, the definition of strategic at the moment, which most people use, is, is, is linked to, uh, you know, higher level decision makers take strategic decisions. Um, these days, there is there, there can be very little difference between a strategic decision taken at a high level and a very minor decision taken at a very low level. The the, the sort of um, the bleed from strategic to tactical in military sp speak, or board level and C suite to um, operator in industry speak, is becoming very very compressed. And cyber is precisely one of the reasons why it is becoming compressed because it is an instantaneous decision option. It can have a huge follow-on effect. Um, and then if you apply that in the maritime zone, it can be even more exacerbated because of the simple fact that virtually everything in the maritime space could be, could be strategic. Um, it, it's just the, um, strat st the strategic perspective now, I would suggest, is linked to ubiquity. Anything that is ubiquity and instantaneousness, anything that is very, very quick, goes a long way and affects a lot of things is strategic by its nature. Mm -hmm. um, and the maritime cyberspace is absolutely in that, in that area. And do you think, David, just as a, a personal aside here, is that it's about distributed decision making that we now have to upskill people throughout the business to be able to make decisions and also empower them to do that because of the very nature of the situation that you describe? Yes, uh, I would. I'm, I'm a bit radical in my approach to this. Um, I, I no longer really believe in a hierarchy of decision making expertise or that, you know, big people make big decisions. Uh, we have to get ourselves to a, to a space in which everybody understands the consequences of the decisions they're making and also the size and shape of the decisions that they are making. Mm -hmm. If that's distributed decision making, so be it. I mean, it can still be controlled by those who are more senior within or in an organization, but that requires very rapid communication and to, to, you know, to allow for that interchange of ideas, the exchange of uh, you know, consequences, the breaking down of, of biases, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Okay, thank you. Thierry has asked us a question. Um, cybersecurity in the maritime industry is very much a blank slate. It was not on the radar until very recently. Would that require a specific decision-making approach? Um, uh, to, to, it's very tempting to say yes to that, but actually, I'm I'm not sure I I'm not sure I can. I think it, does it require a specific decision-making approach? Actually, what it requires is a series of decision-making approaches tailored to the maritime world. Um, where a lot of the input came from maritime experts and a lot of the input came from people who probably have nothing to do with the maritime world. Again, in, in my experience, one of the biggest problems with senior decision makers is that they lack, sub, they lack objectivity. Most of their decisions, because of the background of 30 or 40 years they've spent 
in that industry are really quite subjective. And that plays into the, you know, the Alice paradox and the ability to believe, bring yourself to believe impossible things before breakfast. So I think I agree with the tone of the question from Thierry. There is a, you know, every, every major industry probably requires a, some sort of tailored specific decision-making process but will that process be one simple one? No, I think it will be a variety of ones. And I think it will need to be adapted as time goes on, because we can start on day one um, and develop the best suite of decision-making processes you can. By day 12, at least one of those will probably be out of date. Yes, and that sort of very much is supported by the psychology in the way that the brain works, as I explained earlier. You have to learn about the underlying principles behind the situation you're in not just to react intuitively to each situation in order to be able to transfer that learning and build up that level of expertise but that level of expertise only comes really with experience but to understand and learn the best from that experience you have to insert a review process into it military wise it's the after action review um, and that itself is difficult in some ways because it's not necessarily the way that we do things in our organisations, the tendency is to very much solve the problem, breathe a sigh of relief, move on and business as usual, where actually it's very much worth spending the time reviewing what happened in order to, to learn as much as you can from it and perhaps prevent something happening next time rather than just react to it. That in itself might require some organisational cultural changes. Yeah, absolutely.